Good day, everyone. My name is Lars Janiko. I'm an energy economist. I live primarily in Europe and Singapore, and I've been studying energy economics and commodities for many, many years. Um, I'm also an author. I've written a couple of books. Today, I would like to discuss um, the, the cost of future temperature increase. As an energy economist, of course, energy and climate change are very much connected in today's world and, and of course, the discussion, as you can see. And I really want to understand better, okay, what actually are the costs of climate change as per the current literature? Um, I have to do a little bit of advertising for our new book. It's called The Unpopular Truth about Electricity and the Future of Energy. It discusses exactly that, the future of energy, and discusses the current electricity systems. It discusses, it discusses wind, solar, uh, conventional coal, gas, all those things, and, and how energy electricity works, and why certain things work, and why certain things doesn't work. Um, it also discusses hydrogen and many other things. So please do read it, give me feedback, and I look forward to hear from you. Now, to understand the cost of, of temperature increase. Um, I went a step further. Let's say, look, we as humans have an impact on our world every single day. And we impact GDP sometimes in very large ways. And uh, when I prepared for a, a presentation in East Africa just last week on energy, um, I actually went through the BP Energy Outlook 2023 and I found an interesting analysis on page 24, which says that the Russia-Ukraine war cause will cause about a 2% drop in GDP by 2050. I found that number very, very high. Even more surprising for me was that the same report says, oh, by the way, in 2050, because of the energy disruptions caused by this war, which is already terrible for humans, but also for the economies worldwide, this will cost a 6% or cause 6% drop in GDP in emerging nations that may cost as much as 7.5%, 8% of GDP drop, while in the developed world, maybe about 2%. I mean, that's a large number. Um, and this is like a human impact on GDP because of war. Um, COVID is another example that we had in the past years. And COVID, as per Statista, updated this year, um, caused um, or caused the world to you know to collectively fell uh, reduce the GDP by three and a half percent. If you assume the world would have grown otherwise two to three percent, you can probably say that COVID caused a five to six percent drop in global GDP. I mean, it's a very serious large number. So these are two recent examples of what we humans do: wars, pandemics that have an impact on our development. So going back to the question of, of climate change and the costs of temperature rise and temperature increase, I went back to the press, I went back to the IPCC. The IPCC does various reports, and one of their reports, uh, the 1.5 degree special report, um, has an interesting number. They're saying that a 2.6% GDP loss uh, would be caused from a 3.7 degree temperature rise in the year 2100. This is the statement they make. They are quoting, um, not quoting, but they're, they're analyzing various other studies. So the IPCC does not do any research themselves, but the scientists there analyze other studies. And you can see some of those studies that they analyzed, Warren, Pretis, Broke, Schindel. And they say it's a large uncertainty range, but uh, from a 3.66 degree temperature rise, we can expect roughly a 2.6 uh, GDP loss, percent GDP loss, but the uncertainty could be as little as 0.5% loss of GDP, could be as much as 8% loss of GDP in 2100. Now, the UN climate change then in October last year, just very recently updated, oh, by the way, the world is now on track for around two and a half degree warming by the end of the century. So because of what we have done already, what we're doing, there is a re reduced expectancy of the future temperature. And if you put those things together now, and, and if you understand that as per the IPCC, the relationship between warming and GDP loss, the warmer it would become, the more loss we will have, um, um, they say, okay, the GDP loss of 1.2% per degree of warming as per the IPCC estimates, and if you put the things together, in fact, you say, well, this two and a half degree warming, you know, would actually cause about a one, one and a half percent GDP loss, which a large uncertainty from 0 0.2 to 4 percent. Again, I use just a simple linear relationship between these two, which is maybe not correct, but very approximate. It gives you a sense of per the IPCC understanding and um, studying various academic research, what they come up with. Now, the IPCC is not everything and there's many other studies out there. So I went a step further. And by the way, the IPCC is the International Panel of Climate Change. It's a UN globally government funded body studying climate change, just in case you're not familiar with them. Now, I went a step further. Professor Nordhaus, I found him. Professor Nordhaus is actually um, a Nobel Prize winner in 2018. He won the Nobel Prize exactly for climate change economic, for exactly studying the impact of climate change and the cost of mitigating for climate change. 
And um, um, Nordhaus made a few interesting statements. Number one, he confirmed what the IPCC says, that there is a large uncertainty in all of this, right? We don't know exactly what's going to happen in 80 years. Obviously, we don't. He just repeats that. We are not really quite sure. Another important statement he makes that, by the way, um, we are showing a more rapid growth of output in the baseline or no policy path or scenario. What does that mean? That means he confirms what actually economics know, that the, the, the more we mitigate, the more we try to reduce future emissions, the more GDP this will cost. So if we continue as is, the GDP growth will be the most, the highest. If we go greener, the greener we go, the less GDP growth we have in the future. He just confirms that. It's, again, not in discussion in economic circles. We understand all this, but this is what he, as a Nobel Prize winner, repeats. Another important statement he also makes is, by the way, international target for climate change with a limit of two degrees appears to be infeasible with reasonably accessible technologies, even with very ambitious abatement strategies. So he makes a statement. Based on his analysis, he sees very little chance to stay below two degrees under his scenarios. Okay, so what did he do? He analyzed um, um, various scenarios. He, first, he analyzed the no climate policy. We just go as is. And in that case, using his, his own assumptions, he comes up with a 4.1 degree warming from pre-industrial times until 2100, doing nothing. Then he has his optimal path where he would, based on his model, suggest, well, the optimal path for me from a GDP perspective is to target a warming of three degrees um, um, or three and a half degrees, whatever, roughly, by, by, uh, by 2100. And the most aggressive strategy, um, what he calls the, the, the 2.5 degree scenario, um, he would have, that, that would cause a warming of maybe 2.2 degrees or something. So... Since GDP output is higher with a no policy and lower with an aggressive climate change policy, Nordhausen calculates the optimal path in regards to the CO2 emission using certain damage functions that result in temperature increases. Interesting is that there are some arguments online that, that Nordhausen underestimates the costs of climate change. And I would counter that argument, well, so far until 2023, the percentage of GDP, the cost of extreme weather events, of natural disasters, as the percentage of GDP has been going down slightly, even though the absolute cost has been increasing, but because becoming wealthier and richer and because we're more people actually, as percentage of GDP until now for the past decades has been actually reduced. So we've becoming better in, in managing those extreme weather events. All right, he then goes, of course, a step further and analyzes what would have to be the CO2 emissions in a no climate policy. He assumes that CO2 emissions would only peak at around 2100. In his optimal scenario that he calculates, GDP emissions would peak at around 2045, 2050. And in his most extreme two and a half degree scenario, GDP, uh, CO2 emissions would have to drop immediately, unrealistically, to very, very low levels. Um, he makes a lot of assumptions, so there's a damage function assumption. He assumes that there's no adaptation to climate change. He has to make an assumption on the climate sensitivity. That means how much warming is caused by a doubling of CO2 of 3 degrees. Um, that number is in line with the consensus, but there's certain evidence out there that actually that number is too high, that, um, that the number is, should be lower. But there's a lot of discussion, a lot of uncertainty in that. He makes discount rate assumptions, GDP assumptions. He only discusses CO2. He doesn't discuss methane or other externalities. And very important. He uses um, a, a scenario for his, his analysis uh, in DICE that is consistent but slightly lower with IPCC's RCP 8.5, what we call high emissions and actually implausible scenario. We discussed that, but this is RCP 8.5. It's a very extreme scenario that's done for academic purposes that is very far from the real world. So his outcome is that at a three degree warming in his optimal scenario, we would have a 2.8% drop in GDP if we were to do nothing, the world would be richer, but we would have a bigger drop in GDP at four degree warming. We would have a 3.8% uh, GDP loss. But again, the outcome GDP would actually still be higher than in this optimal scenario. But he weighs off those costs for each other. I went one step further. There's another more recent study, Carnet Al. And Carnet Al is like a mini meta study of doing exactly that, understanding the, the, the GDP impact from temperature increase. And you can see all these studies that they analyzed. Boca et al. is one of the most extremes. Boca et al. assumes at a four degree warming, a 23% drop, percent drop in GDP. 
You can see here the Nordhaus number, Nordhaus again with the three degrees warming, a 2.8% drop in GDP, so at three degrees, a 2.8% uh, drop in GDP. I put in the IPCC number, IPCC says roughly at a no policy, if we don't do anything at 3.8 degree warming, right, you would have a 2.6 degree, um, sorry, percentage point drop in GDP with a high uncertainty range. And um, Khan et al. is a bit more concerned, is more is, uh, um, about the future. He is assuming at a four degree warming per century, it's a very high warming, he assumes a 7.2% 7 drop in GDP, again, using this 8 point, RCP 8.5 implausible high emissions scenario. Why do I say implausible? Because in this scenario, in this extreme scenario that's done by the IPCC, for instance, the per capita coal consumption would increase six times from today until 2100. That means every single person would consume on average worldwide six times more coal than today. That's uh, just an, ex an example of, of how implausible that scenario is, but it's been used anyways. Even though, despite that scenario, if you go to a two and a half degree warming, even Carnet Al comes to a three to five percent drop in GDP range, which is higher than what uh, Nordhaus says, higher than what the IPCC says, but it's still within that single digit range, just to give you a sense. So we discussed um, now, you know, what the expected cost of climate change could be. We now discuss a little bit about the cost of the transitioning away from fossil fuels, the cost of transitioning or reducing um, emissions, primarily CO2 emissions, of course. McKinsey, a large consulting firm, has done a study last year on this called the Net Zero Transition. And um, the capital spending in this transition would have to be, especially in the short term, very much front loaded. It means we have to spend a lot of money now to make hopefully a difference in, in, in 80 years. Either way, they are estimating that this cumulative spending would probably be $275 trillion, roughly about 7.5% of global GDP from 21 to 2050. Um, they make another important statement that for the poorer countries, this will be even more expensive. So the poorer countries and those, of course, with iron fossil fuels will be most exposed to the net zero transition. In other words, of saying they will have to pay more percentage-wise of their GDP. Wood McKenzie, another um, large um, um, established consulting company, had another report, similar time, no pain, no gain. And they're saying that the cost of net zero would have to be 75 trillion less than what McKinsey says. They confirm that um, less developed and low-income nations will be have to bear uh, a disproportionately high burden. They have to pay more uh, because they're poorer um, and they will have a bigger impact. And they say if we become more aggressive in our target into 1.5 degree, we would shave off another 2% of GDP. Overall, they're saying in that, in that report um, that this will translate roughly to a 10% per capita GDP loss by 2050 based on going net zero. So in summary, we have discussed certain human cost um, disruptions um, that cause a GDP drop. And uh, we have seen that just the, the Ukraine war and COVID, you know, we're talking about a two to 8% of GDP impact by 2050. That's how much this can cost if we do whatever we do as humans. Um, we discussed the, the cost or the impact of climate change of temperature increase on the GDP. Uh, and we've seen that probably somewhere in a range of half to 4% of GDP in 2100 from a warming of two and a half degrees could be, you know, caused um, by, by our temperature change, uh, by global warming. And we have discussed how much it actually costs to mitigate exactly this global warming, the cost could be double. It could be seven to 10% per capita of GDP in 2050. However, this cost is in 2050 versus the benefit potentially 50 years later. So, I will not comment further on this, but just gives you a sense of stepping, taking a step back and looking at the global numbers of what happens. I, again, realize that GDP is not a perfect measure, but GDP does give me an, an indication of the wealth creation. The wealthier we are, the better we can withstand any, any extreme weather events. And the more the bigger houses we can build, the more air condition we can have, um, the bigger dams we can build. So uh, I hope you found this interesting and, and, and useful. Um, I at least learned a lot doing this. And uh, I also give you a bit of a disclaimer. Don't trust anything I say. Check all the sources at the bottom. I give everything. Read it yourself. Um, um, so um, please be careful. It's my own personal opinion, of course. I do, by the way, agree that the world is warming. There's no question for me. I also agree that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and contributes to warming. I also agree that humans contribute to the measured temperature increase. And the question, of course, is how much and what is caused by and all those things, but we don't get there right now. I agree with those three statements. Um, however, 
I am from the commodity industry, the energy commodity industry, I am biased. So please be careful. I do own shares in oil, coal and gas companies. And uh, I'm also a significant shareholder in the German listed company called HMS Bergbau AG, dealing with commodities worldwide. Any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm available um, um, on case by case to discuss in your company, in your school, in your university, these issues. Um, again, please read my book. You'll find it interesting, hopefully, and give me feedback. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and look forward to be in touch in the future.